Island Films. The home of high-powered, high-voltage motion picture entertainment. With the screen's biggest spectacles, brightest stars, and boldest lineup of explosive entertainment. We're taking motion picture excitement over the edge and your box office over the top. Canon Films, and we're dynamite. I could have been so many things. I had friends, and I had talent and a drive to do well. I could have been happy and successful. I could have lived my life. Instead, I'm here. Heroin brought me here. One try was all it took. Now, all I have is this cold metal bed. We're watching Amicus is Horror, I Monster. Now, Amicus mm. is a company that's mostly known for anthology films, right, Matthew? Yeah, Portmanteau and, films, yeah. <laughs> as they were called delightfully. And they're pretty famous in the UK, or, I mean, in Europe? I mean, they're definitely not as famous as Hammer, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Hammer is the gold standard, even though Amicus shares so much DNA with uh, Hammer. It's... I would say they're mostly famous for the Portmanteau films. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, sure. I, I actually was surprised when this when this film started and it was an Amicus production because I was like, wait, I'm expecting to see three different stories happen linked very, you know, randomly by some sort of wider story. And it's not that. It's a terrible uh, version of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Whoa, spoiler <laughs> We didn't get into the plot yet. I mean, do you have any favorite Amicus movies, uh, Jay? Or? Uh, well, I haven't seen a lot of them. Um, there's a few uh, I have seen, like the uh, some of the um, uh, anthologies like Tales from the Crypt and uh, mm, Vault, Vault of Horror. Horror. I've seen yeah. those, yeah. Um, but yeah, you're right. They are mainly known for their, um, for their anthologies, but they did do... Uh, some standalones and also some stuff that wasn't even horror. I think they started with like some musicals or some sort of lighter fare. Our, our movie opens. Yes. Um, with uh, uh, Christopher Lee in his lab laboratory and he's doing stuff and the first kind of the first thing we see is a super grody close-up of like a pickled two-headed baby this is literally the grossest thing you've seen in the entire movie there are no more hor horrific things yeah you've movie. seen it that is all that, the horror that's all the harder than this supposed horror movie remember that i monster there's no monster <laughs> in this movie so don't expect it there's a shadow of a monster Ugh. anyway keep going yeah, and uh the, the funniest thing that happens at the beginning for me is when it's giving the the, the credits the art director is called Tony Curtis. And I was just like, Tony that's, Curtis? That's what I thought too. I was like, I was like, he was moonlighting. He was like, yeah, I'd like to go to Britain and do, you know, just a little bit of art direction to... I don't want to go under a pseudonym, I'll go under my own name. Uh Christian had a thing for Tony Curtis, so he brought over Some Like It Hot and Sporadicus. Um, but yeah, uh, it kind of starts. Um, he's doing He's doing his... his, uh, his what do you call it? Experiments? Yes. That's, that's a word they would use for scientists doing things. And he also goes to his favorite gentleman's club, let's say. Now, nowadays, gentleman's club would mean a place you would see ladies take their clothes off. <laughs> unhappy women, unhappy men. Back in the day, it was, of course, like these amazing sort of house-looking places with uh, big chairs. And people and with monocles. People with monocles, smoking pipes. And it starts kind of a, 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 a discussion or a speech which I feel like I've heard so many times in movies mm -hmm. which is characters just discussing whether or not evil is nature or nurture and I mean honestly I was like oh my god I actually even though at the beginning it's like based on a strip Robert Louis Stevenson 
I was kind of like, ah, oh, what is this going to be? The minute that conversation started, I was like, ah, oh, it's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. <laughs> you didn't even know. I like how Magic does no research before he watches the Well, because it's going to still gonna be fresh and exciting. You know, like, I'm, so, I'm, so many emotions go through your mind. You're like, is this an anthology film? I didn't know it was horror. Hey, look, Christopher <laughs> Lee, Peter Cushing, who looks like he came in on a few days off. Like, the lowest wattage Peter Cushing you oh, can get. Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, Dr. Lanyon thinks that men are born fundamentally good and corrupted only by society. I wonder what you think, my dear fellow. And you just gave it away. Christopher, Christopher Lee is trying, for sure, though, I would say. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, they have that discussion about what nature or nurture doesn't really go anywhere. Hello, Dr. Lanyon and I have discussed this matter before. It's bad enough you practicing the ideas of this Dr. Freud of Vienna. But your own theory is very more dangerous. Damn. It's like you lost our bet. He hasn't done anything yet. Well, you are an optimist, huh? Now I just have faith. Then we go back to Christopher Lee, who's who's doing classic movie experimentation, which is, you know, you have a beaker and you pour the thing into a beaker and it bubbles and you go, yes, <laughs> I'm pleased with this. The thing in the beaker bubbled. Progress, mister. That's real progress. Well, it's, it's this kind of thing that uh, kind of brings tears to my eyes. And then he goes, I'm going to inject this thing into me. But then he remembers he has a cat. And yeah, because the cat goes, meow. And he's, like, oh, yeah. him. he's like, oh, yeah, I got a cat. I have a cat. He also has a monkey. The monkey just stays in the cage. He never, and the monkey makes a lot of noise. He never goes, I should inject the monkey. He goes, I'll inject the cat. And I'm like, oh, good cat. We're going to get like a cat monster. Uh, or it's it's going like, to be awesome. Or we're just going to see a lot of a cat. I mean, I like cats. <laughs> Like You're films. that easy to please. Yeah, I'm pretty easy. Like, I was like, ah, oh, a cat. Um, and of course, then he ejects the cat. It becomes evil. And so Christopher Lee has to bludgeon the cat to death. You stop that, you bad kitty. And like the cat doesn't even do anything that wrong. Like it jumps up, knocks a bunch of beakers out, and hisses, and then it jumps on him, and his first reaction is to slam it on the ground. And I think they grab like a poker and just like bash yeah, its back, head in. And this is all off screen. We don't see any horrible cat murder, which is like I was appreciate that, but it sure. really does set the tone, which is you will never see anything horrifying. <laughs> So we get into one of these, like, another boring discussion of the super ego, the Ed, all this, all this nonsense. ...to repress in his unconscious a part of himself that he will not allow his conscious self to admit. Supposing a way could be found of accelerating that process by the use of a drug, physically harmless, of course, that would break down the barriers of the unconscious. Are you trying to tell us that you have found such a drug? I'm not entirely sure. Oh, oh God, oh. just do it already! But really what it, comes, what it comes down to in the end is that he oh, just starts injecting himself with stuff and becoming, you know, Mr. Hyde or Edward Blake. Yeah, his name's Edward Blake in this. And I'd like to point out, you know, the best adaptations of uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, they turn into literal monsters. Yeah. Like, that's what I was expecting. I'm like, oh, yeah, he's going to turn into some furry monster. I believe the cover for this, is it like a furry monster? It's just like, I monster. I don't think he's a furry monster. Anyway, it's like so his that... face with, like, fangs and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, yeah! So basically, all Christopher Lee does is he hunches over, and he kind of goes like, eh. <laughs> And no, I think his hair starts to, like, thin on top. Yeah, that, well, this is the other thing, is that first time he injects himself with it, literally all he does is smile and walk around the... <laughs> Light a Bunsen burner well, yeah, on. Yeah, and he's like, well, hey, I'm having fun. And I'm like, I don't understand, like, how is this um, How is this monstrous behaviour? He picks up a mouse that he's going to oh, stab. And the, and, and the mouse does some crazy good acting. Because the mouse is, like, shitting itself. It's, like, shaking. It's like, please, please, don't, don't stab me with... 
like that. Like it never says any of those things, but you get so much out of it. Like this mouse is doing such a hard job. But guess job, what? And he's Nothing working, happens. Yeah, he's working way harder though than Peter Cushing, I thought. I think that mouse yeah. should be higher ranked than Peter Cushing. <laughs> the Christopher Lee, the mouse. Yeah, Christopher Lee, a mouse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But so yeah, so this is basically we're setting down what's going to happen in the and they and they talk about how when someone takes this um, serum that the super ego disappears and like not anything can happen. Yeah, they, they, the one character says they were like, "What would happen if you didn't have a super ego?" And the, and the character says, "You would be the most dangerous human on earth." And every blind impulse, every repressed desire, every secret wish. He would be the most dangerous human being on earth. Somebody we know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and they talk about what happened off screen that Christopher Lee did, which was knock a guy over. And no, he, got... he knocked a little girl over. <laughs> no, like, and then she, and then they're like, I would like a hundred pounds. And he agrees. And he agrees. <laughs> And he goes and gives it to them. It's a, it's a really bizarre segment where they're like the most, if you didn't ever see me, you'd be the most dangerous man on earth. And another kind of going, I have this story about this man who knocked over a girl, so we all made him give her a hundred pounds, and he did it. But the strange thing is, this man seemed to have something to do with Marlowe, who's played by Christopher Lee. Perhaps six or seven, who was running as hard as she was able from the doorway of that church over there. The two of them ran into one another, naturally enough, at this corner. But then came the horrible part of the thing. For having knocked the child down, the man trampled calmly over her body and left her lying on the ground. Good Lord. No. It was a terrible accident. It's no one's fault. She wasn't paying attention. She's done it before. Of course, I chased after him, collared the gentleman, and brought him back to where there was already quite a group around the injured child. Well, we ran him up to a hundred pounds for the sake of the child's family, but at the hundred he stuck. Clowns, what a ripper! It does, it's definitely a gradual transformation, if you can even call it that, because first he's just, you know, walking around with that shit eating grin on his face, but uh, it is at that point where you're like, oh, I guess that they, you're just supposed to know that Nobody yeah. knows. He's like a different <laughs> it's person. It's like Superman, like his face is vibrating when he... Yeah, I mean, that's... I mean, it's... I mean, spoiler, there's a man who sees him transform, and the transformation is just his hair gets back into place, yeah. and the man has a heart attack <laughs> and dies. He's a hard man to kill, but he's not immortal. Our time will come. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, while he's evil, he mostly smiles. Uh, he bumps into people walking around the town. <laughs> he smashes some windows. He I mean, threatens one guy, but doesn't really hurt him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like the, that guy looks just like Jamie Bell as well. I thought, <laughs> which was. Uh... Oh, aren't we just the scary serial vamps? Or the spooky lair? And the taking of the trophies of our victims. I'm trying to point out that the kid with the knife, when he threatens him, he goes towards the camera and he's like, oh, that's because this movie was supposed to be shot in 3D. Oh, mm. that makes sense. Yeah, because at a lot of point, like at one point, Christopher Lee, like, oh, yeah, 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 he pokes yeah. at I the wondered screen. why he did that, yeah. There's but, a lot of stuff when you look at it. But uh, it's weird because supposedly they stopped shooting in 3D before the movie started, but it's like they had these storyboards and they're like, I'm not changing them. This mm. is what's happening. They're going to go towards the screen. Ah. There's a lot of stuff like that. Even just like the camera movements and, mm -hmm. the, and the placement and the framing, you can see that a good deal of it was meant to be shown in 3D. I mean, basically at this point, I have, I have a question. He He's going back and he's writing up the uh, his experiments, which is taking the drug. And at one point we see he's done it nine times. And in this process of this nine times, he's like done a lot of bad stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So I was kind of like, why does he keep taking the drug? And why does he if, if he, why does he keep taking the antidote if he's like enjoying being evil? It just didn't even make any sense to me at this he's point. He's addicted like yeah. heroin. I figured that's what they were going for. Yeah, right? but they didn't really make that clear. Yeah, and there's and there's a uh, there's you know there's some some a bunch of stuff that doesn't really matter. Like he talks a little bit about his past, what his father did, right? Mm -hmm. He mentions his father's walking stick, and he says he used it for things besides walking. <laughs> and I was like, oh, like all fashionable doctors, my 
father carried a gold-headed cane. He used it for other things besides walking. Truth is, I don't want to know. Um, and ultimately it comes to sort of a guess, which is sort of the, 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 the meat of the matter, which is as he's becoming uglier and sounding more and more like Ray Winston, which I, which I noticed, he's... <laughs> Alright, love. Uh, <laughs> right? He goes to a bar to try and meet a woman, I guess. I don't know. I don't even understand what it is that he's, it makes him so evil. Like, yeah, he's so not evil. He's like, hey, let's but he go. But basically, he goes to meet a woman and he just. And, I, and my suspicion is that I guess she's a prostitute or whatever and he's just going to have some, some fun times yeah. with her. But then she's like, oh, why would I be with an ugly chap like you? What would I be doing with an ugly thing like you? <laughs> And then the whole bar laugh at him. And at that point, I mean, he is quite ugly by this point. You know, he's no longer the pure ride from earlier. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, Do you know what? I'm on his side. I'm on his side now. It doesn't matter how evil everyone's saying he is. Maybe, maybe this movie's going to go a totally different way. It doesn't. What he does is he chases the woman and then murders her with his with his walking stick. Yes. I'm mean, not. But it's not that horrific. But it's like ten transformations after he started. Like how how long has it taken the super ego to like disintegrate? And why wasn't he like? I don't know, like, just grab the woman and, like, hurt the, the people that are laughing at him. I guess that would be too exciting. And it's not even like he just murders her when she leaves. It's like he slowly <laughs> chases after her for, like, ten minutes. You guys cook like old people fuck. Yeah, but what's weird is, is that after this murder, he doesn't so much go, well, I've killed someone, the experiment's over, and I should turn myself into the police. He he sort of keeps, tr tries to cover it up, but in either, for either form, in his evil form and his good form, he experiences a lot of remorse and, and yeah. hiding and running away. I believe that the murderer was Edward Blake, what reason? The girl headed cane found near the body. It was exactly the same as the one Blake was carrying the night I confronted him. There are many such canes, no doubt. Not so many men capable of committing such a murder. All men are capable of committing crimes, Charles. Provided they are not restrained by the good that is in them. That is not the way you spoke the last time we discussed the subject. I changed my mind. As for Edward Blake, I have done with him. I give you my word that we shall never set eyes on him again. You seem very sure of him. Oh, I am. I know who you really are. Oh, who am I? You're a killer. Sucking the fucking life out of all of us! Well, we haven't really mentioned this. Pierre Cushing is sort of vaguely solving this situation. Yeah, he seems kind of disinterested. I wasn't really sure what his position was. He was just around. It's like they had like a horror meetup and like Peter Cushing was there and Christopher yeah. Lee. Vincent Price had already no. left by the time we got there. No, sir. He went out about half an hour ago. Did he say where he was going? Uh, no, sir. I'll wait for him. Now, come out. He's, one day Peter Cush comes around and he's like, so what's going on with that Edward Blake guy? And uh, Christopher he's like, uh, he uh, wrote me this letter where he said he would just leave and never come back. And he's like, uh, oh, um, how did you get this letter? Um, it was delivered to me by uh, someone earlier today and um, that you should just just leave it alone, mate. Just leave it alone. So obviously Peter Cushing's like, well, that's obviously a lot of rubbish. It's the most awkward lie ever. And I was like, okay. I burned the envelope. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> he's like, I burned the envelope. I was like, okay, well, the you, you end. Sure it's police or not, as you will. Was it Blake who dictated the terms of your will? I knew it. Smile, you're at Mr. Smiley's. You are so busted. What happens is the drug. He's, it's like acid. He's got it in his system and he's going to have flashbacks. So he goes into the park, 
to have a nice little sit down and his hand starts playing an invisible trumpet <laughs> and he's like oh no this means I'm turning back into Edward Blake um, he has to run away um, and I mean and this is as evil version he runs away like you're like wouldn't he be like, like oh, his, I'm evil now I'm, yeah, I'm evil enjoying it so like he sees a child who like sticks his tongue out you do I mean you expect evil Edward Blake to be like well I'm just gonna have to kill this child now but he's like oh no he runs away <laughs> What he does is he comes home, he writes on a piece of paper, um, no one suspects except perhaps Utterson, who is played by Kurt Cushing. Um, and I was like, why would you write this down? <laughs> like, no one suspects. Which I was like, is he writing that down for his evil self? Because in that case, doesn't he keep the memories? Because it's just confusing by that point. So he goes to kill Utterson, basically. And this is the best part of the movie, if, if you've already enjoyed the earlier cat. Peter Cushing is holding a cat. Yep. <laughs> He's holding a cat. He holds it for a while. He doesn't kill this cat. He strokes it. The cat is attractive. <laughs> not, in a, not in a sexy way. <laughs> <laughs> is that how you describe your cat as attractive? I think my cat's very attractive. Fuck a bull, if you may. <laughs> ah, dude, that cat's pure raid, man. That cat's a pure raid. You know, if I was Skeletor and I was riding a giant purple cat. <laughs> okay, anyway, keep going. Um, And then he basically... Just tries to kill Peter Cushing. Peter Cushing. They fight in a in, in a shot that is one long take that goes across windows and like stays on the brick for a while. And I yeah. assume that an amazing fight is happening on the other side. Yeah. And then this is what happens: he falls down the stairs and dies. That's, <laughs> that's like, it. That's like literally the end. On fire? Yeah, well, he's on fire. But like, who cares? Like, <laughs> it's it's like it's like the worst grandpa death ever. You know, it's like <laughs> I, it's just like. Is that how your grandfather died? <laughs> he fell down the stairs on fire. Yes, it's true. Goodness gracious, great balls of fire! An interview um, with um, Savatsky, who was one of the guys who ran Amicus, and he was basically saying that, you know, when he did this, there was a bunch of people that had already done Jekyll and Hyde, obviously, so he wanted to just do the, like, the definitive version. But uh, then when they did it, they realized, oh, this is actually kind of boring, because there's not really any action in the Robert Louis Stevenson story, so... I guess that was maybe why they tried to punch it up with the 3D. I don't know, but um, it makes it. it he know, was aware of that. Yeah, he was aware that it was boring. And it, it, but watching the movie, it makes me think of like these companies. Like, what do they think the viewer wants out of the movies? Because the movie has no blood, like no gore, no shocks really. So it's like, what, what, like, what is horrifying about a man who can't control himself? But that man doesn't really look that scary. So. I don't know. I think it also might just be to do with like bad timing. Like this, on the grand scheme of things, was very late. Like the Hammer did a uh, Jekyll and Hyde movie um, called uh, Two Faces of Doctor Jekyll. I think. Yeah, didn't they Crystal do a Lee daughter of Jekyll? Sisters? Uh, yeah, yeah, sister, sister or something like that. But I mean, that the the Hammer version was like in 1960 or something, mm -hmm. and this was like way later. And by the early 70s, there was like some really wild stuff coming out. So. Watching this after that, like say something like um, Abominable Doctor Fives, so yeah. like this is this is like a regression. Mm -hmm. I'm not really interested in this stuff anymore. Mm -hmm. So uh, why do you think it did poorly? I, I want to really get to the notes that you've written down here. Well, that's pretty much it. <laughs> you already got it. <laughs> what I just said. Rated PG. Parental guidance suggested. All right. Well, my name is Justin the Clue. Jay Clark. I was Matthew Kumar. Thanks for, for listening to Loose Cannons.